Hey, how's it going guys? It's Nate here. And the post-atomic world of Fallout 4 is a very intriguing one indeed. Watching as a fractured society attempts to rebuild amongst a plethora of new radiation-induced challenges is certainly an entertaining way to spend an evening. However, this brave new world is also quite a mysterious one, and many of Fallout 4's quests and tales leave us with more questions than they do answers. Some more significant, or even creepy, than others. So with that in mind, I thought what better way to spend a day than diving into some of the most intriguing questions Fallout 4 leaves us with. Sit back and relax as we dive into five spooky Fallout 4 mysteries. Starting off, we have whatever happened at Fairline Hill. Fairline Hill Estates is a small suburban cul-de-sac south of Boston proper and north of Milton General Hospital. When the sole survivor first arrives, you'll be attacked by two leveled Yao Guai, and towards the center of the neighborhood, in the small park, will be the fresh corpses of two Brahmin, as well as two human skeletons. Now, at first, this may not come across as particularly odd, at least not in a world like Fallout. Things die all the time, and there were just two mutated bears here, nothing too out of the ordinary. However, if the player has Preston Garvey as an active follower while visiting this location, he'll have this to say. Hmm, where did everybody go? Used to be a small settlement here. In fact, most of your companions will actually comment when taken to this place, some also referencing settlements, but Preston's statement is the most blatant. Apparently not too long ago, there was a community here. So, where did everyone go? Clearly, the dead Brahmin and human remains at the neighborhood center aren't the best of signs. Perhaps they were once a part of this now abandoned settlement. Further inspection of the various pre-war houses won't provide us with many leads. They're all empty, which is quite normal in a post-apocalyptic world, though there are some signs humans were recently here. A still-burning lantern and a power armor station can be found in the garage of one house, and a chem station exists in another. So people have been here, but one home stands out from all the others. A white building on the suburb's west end has clearly been fortified. Tin can chimes sit on the front porch to alert to any movement, and the front door is chained shut from the inside. A toy monkey guards the back entrance as well. The only way in is through a makeshift stairway leading to the home's second floor. Once inside, you'll find a human skeleton, next to two pipe weapons, as well as what's left of what was clearly this individual's living space. Also on this floor will be a chained shut door, leading to another room, but more on that later. Back on the first floor, you'll discover the front door is rigged to an entire trigger system with two different weapons aimed at it. Whoever occupied this house last clearly was trying to keep something out. Should you decide to unchain that second floor doorway we just mentioned, three ghouls will storm outside of it, including a glowing one, which for obvious reasons won't be very friendly. There's not much more to this place, but from the looks of it, this person was obviously guarding a small pack of ghouls. Why? And why in this town of all places? Was he a part of that previously mentioned settlement here at Fairline Hill Estates? Did the people know about the literal monsters in his closet? And again, what led to this community's demise and eventual abandonment? Were they attacked by raiders or super mutants perhaps? There aren't very many signs of a great struggle, minus the corpses at the center. Perhaps everyone just decided to move on to greener pastures. It seems we may never know the tale behind this post-apocalyptic Roanoke. Next on our list, we take to the skies in the Brotherhood of Steel's great capital airship, the Pridwin. As this one concerns none other than the faction's head honcho, Elder Maxon himself as he may be harboring a very dark secret. You see, Proctor Quinlan, the Brotherhood's head of archives and records aboard the Pridwin, has a terminal in his office with a variety of seemingly miscellaneous pieces of information regarding the Brotherhood. But one set of entries, written by this post-war librarian of sorts, is a bit of a mini-biography of Elder Maxon that specifically documents the man's rise to power and leadership. In the terminal, Quinlan states he feels the need to preserve this important information of history, and goes on to paint a pretty impressive picture of the synth-hating elder. Apparently by age 13, Maxon had murdered a Deathclaw to death single-handedly, and by 16, he was made the Brotherhood of Steel's leader in the wake of a power vacuum. From there, Maxon reintegrated the Brotherhood outcasts back into the organization, this was in the Capital Wasteland, and continued to expand the Brotherhood's influence across the East Coast eventually making his way over to Boston, where our story concludes. But here Quinlan ends the terminal entries on a very odd note. 
This is the closing paragraph written by the Proctor. Quote, Arthur Maxon is happy to be one thing, the perfect human specimen, an example of everything a human being can achieve. Assisted, even enhanced by advanced technology, but still very much human. End quote. Enhanced by advanced technology? Wait, what? I think the first thing that comes to mind in a context like this is cybernetics, similar to what Kellogg has. But nowhere in the entire game is it ever even alluded to that Maxon possesses such an asset. Nowhere else in his writings does Quinlan elaborate on what he means. But surely he didn't just throw that in there for fun. To our knowledge, Maxon hasn't stained any injuries significant enough to necessitate cybernetic assistance, and he seems to look just fine, so what's the scoop here? Could Maxon really be part man, part machine? Well, frankly, if I knew the answer, I wouldn't be talking about it in this video. Perhaps this could be in relation to cut content, or something Bethesda planned to elaborate on but never got around to. Whatever the case, it would certainly be a bit hypocritical of the Elder, considering his hatred of such similar technology if he himself were being artificially enhanced somehow. Regardless, add Victorium, Elder. For third spot, this one is a tad more lighthearted and less significant in the grand scheme of things than all the others we've featured so far. But when wandering the wastes, the player may randomly at any given location stumble upon the mysterious corpse of a settler in a postman uniform. Approaching the remains will reveal that our curious courier carries a number of letters which will simply unlock some locations on your map. But what's this person doing delivering mail all dressed up in a world like this? Doesn't he realize that there's an apocalypse going on right now? To be fair, we do know that the delivery business is alive and profitable in post-war America. As in New Vegas specifically, your character formerly worked for the shipping company, the Mojave Express, which sent packages and messages across southwestern America. But they certainly didn't expect their runners to wear full postal suits and carry no weapons. So what's this man's story? Who did this delivery boy work for and what took his life? So many questions, so little to work with. For fourth spot, what did our vault tech salesman know that we didn't? Let me elaborate. I'm sure everyone watching this video is already more than familiar with Fallout 4's introduction sequence. After you've finished customizing your character and meeting Codsworth, the player will hear that ominous knock on their door, and open it to find a gleaming vault tech salesman congratulating you on being accepted into the local vault. You can either respond graciously and cooperatively, or ask the man to stop soliciting you. But no matter, you'll ultimately be prompted with some final character customization options, and our representative will head out, saying he's off to give your info to the vault. Of course, just minutes after he leaves, you'll learn that the bombs are already beginning to fall, and you and your family will make your desperate escape to the shelter you've barely been admitted to. Now, this already is quite the coincidence. But, if you initially tell the representative to go bug off and leave your home when he comes to your door, rather than listen to you, he'll respond with some incredibly foreshadowing dialogue. Maybe I don't want to talk to you. No. <clears throat> You do, if you'll excuse my language. The big kaboom is... It's inevitable, I'm afraid. And coming sooner than you may think, if you catch my meaning. With total atomic annihilation occurring just moments after your conversation, it seems this man may have been aware of something that we weren't. Perhaps the company somehow knew what was about to go down. Furthermore, as the Great War manifests in its full form and you evacuate to 111, you'll find your rep is already there, pleading to be allowed inside. Isn't it a little convenient that the nuclear apocalypse began while our representative was on his way to the only safe shelter in the entire area? Later on in game, you'll find that despite being turned away from the vault, our rep did manage to survive, though as a ghoul, and has been living in Good Neighbor for the past seemingly couple hundred years. Unfortunately, he won't elaborate too much on what, if anything, he knew, though you can recruit him as a settler, so... That's nice, I guess. But again, this man's timing is simply too good. So whether he was just trying to be a decent salesman and needed you to sign on and was willing to say anything and just got a little bit lucky with his predictions, or he truly did know something was about to go down, is a question only Bethesda has the answer to. And finally, last on our list, we have the curious case of McCready's son. Robert Joseph McCready is a mercenary in the Commonwealth, who can be found at the Third Rail in Good Neighbor, and can then be hired as a companion for the right number of caps. 
The thing is, as I'm sure many of you know, McCready was actually a character we could meet in Fallout 3 as well. He was a 12-year-old mayor of the child-only metropolis of Little Lamplight, and was quite the stubborn fellow then. But apparently 10 years later, he's matured a great deal, and found himself a long way from the capital wasteland. Though how he got this far is unclear. At least, initially. Because if you manage to make McCready's affinity for you high enough as a companion in Fallout 4, he'll eventually open up to the sole survivor, and give you some more insight on what happened to him after he left Little Lamplight and the events of Fallout 3 concluded. Apparently, after emerging from the cave, he found a wife named Lucy, and together they lived in the Capital Wasteland, and eventually had a child that they named Duncan. Unfortunately though, shortly after the boy was born, Lucy was killed by feral ghouls, leaving McCready a single dad. But his misfortunes didn't stop there, because not too long after losing his wife, his son Duncan then contracted a strange illness. He suddenly came down with a fever and became infested with these weird blue boils all over his skin. This is what prompted McCready to leave the Capital Wasteland and head to the Commonwealth in search of a cure for his boy. After revealing all this information to you, McCready will then ask that you accompany him to the MedTech Research Facility, where he believes a cure can be found. Should you agree, you and your hired gun will go into the feral ghoul-infested facility and successfully find a single vial of the cure, named Prevent, to save Duncan and McCready will forever be in your debt. But it's left unclear what exact disease McCready's son actually has, and how McCready even knows there's a cure in the first place. There's so many holes to this tale. Clearly the virus must have its origins pre-war, especially if MedTech, a pre-war company, developed a cure. Well, many believe that this disease is possibly a resurgence of one that devastated the world before the bombs fell. Prior to the Great War, the United States released a biological weapon they called the New Plague in the Colorado Rocky Mountains. Surprisingly enough, that proved to not be a good idea. As the New Plague began to spread across the people of the United States, it turned into an all-out pandemic. In fact, the Forced Evolutionary Virus, or FEV, the thing that's responsible for most of the super mutants in the wasteland, was originally created to be a cure to the new plague. Okay, but what does this all have to do with McCready's son? Well, his symptoms seem to bear a shocking resemblance to the blue flu. The blue flu was supposed to be a virus that would be prominently featured in the cancelled interplay Fallout game Van Buren. The blue flu was one of the few surviving strains of the new plague, and one of the most prominent symptoms it offered were blue boils across the skin and terrible fevers. Both of which McCready's son definitely demonstrates. Now, considering Van Buren was cancelled, it's very tough to say if Bethesda actually considers the blue flu itself canon. The New Plague itself certainly is, that's referenced across Fallout lore, but the Blue Flu was specific to Van Buren, which, again, doesn't exist anymore. But if Bethesda has decided to bring this virus back, then all of the Wasteland should definitely get ready. And with that, we're going to wrap up. Five spooky mysteries in Fallout 4. Which of the ones featured on this list did you find to be the most intriguing, interesting, or fascinating? And what mysteries and questions do you have about Fallout 4 that I've yet to cover on this channel? Leave a comment down below. As always, like ratings are very much appreciated. Thanks for stopping by everyone, and I hope to catch you all in my next video. Peace out everybody.